Hello, my name is Denise Ozdenis and I'm an English teacher in the Foundations Programme at Abu Dhabi Men's College. Well, in general, I like using apps and web tools because they're multimedia. So students have multi-sensory access to material, to learning material. As Howard Gardner says, people have multiple intelligences, or as neuro-linguistic programmers say, we process information through different learning modes. And so people can listen, they can read, especially if it's visual that goes that um, appeals to their artistic intelligence if it's a graph form they can that appeals to their mathematical spatial intelligence so for example if i'm using a screen casting tool such as explain everything or ask 3 then i can choose a language structure that I'm trying to present and find either graphics or visuals that really empower the students to understand the language potential that that language structure has and then I can talk about it, I can write sentences and the sentences unfold as the students are watching the video screencast. I can use the cursor to highlight key points I can ask questions with Ask3, I can ask questions and it becomes interactive. The students actually while they're watching the screencast video can write answers or if there's something they don't understand they can pose a question for me and the rest of the team so it's very collaborative. And in this way students have deeper learning, they're more engaged because they're processing on several levels. Also if I make screencasts, they become mobile learning. So, for example, a student can process and work with the material outside of the classroom or inside of the classroom. If they realize during exercises that they don't understand something, they don't understand a grammar point, they're free to go back to that screencast and look at the presentation again, which enhances independent learning, and it means that they can work at their own level, listen to something again and again, or with a lot of screencasts, I try to do a simple form and a more complex form because all classes have differentiated language levels, learning levels, and so people can choose the level of entry that best suits them so you don't get students getting bored or you don't get students who are lost because the example I'm giving is too complex. If it was just me speaking to a classroom, I would have to choose a common denominator. I'd have to do, speak to a common level in the class. Whereas if I prepare material, multimedia material, then I'm able to really teach on a one-to-one -one basis. They're there in the language learning system, the language management system, such as uh, Edmodo or eBackpack. And I can say, go and choose the level that best suits you. Well, I really feel that this year, using the iPad, I've really been able to reach all of the students in the class because before, I needed to bring into class a lot of fast finisher materials to challenge the students who knew more language or got through things quickly. And it was sometimes difficult to provide the new material plus the answer keys so students could work independently and not disrupt other people in the class. So now, Students will never run out of material because through different apps or the learning management system I can share lots and lots of materials on a given theme. We also encourage students to look at the key words and they can explore themselves in Safari and find YouTube presentations or online uh, games and activities connected to the language learning point. Therefore if a student really wants to learn, they can actually learn as much as they want in a classroom without the teacher. I mean, the teacher is always there to give encouragement and to explain something, but students aren't limited to the common core of the classroom. Likewise, if a student is struggling with material, I can also make sure that there's extra material there to back up and support so they can start something, say just a moment, I don't understand this, 
and go to something more easy. I also think that it engages students because it's colourful, it's dynamic and it's the modern world. I'm not bringing outdated examples into the classroom. And students are encouraged to make finished products and these finished products, it could be an iBook, a presentation, a keynote presentation, a Prezi presentation or even a screencast themselves, these finished products look very um, polished and published and because they're making them, students are making them for a wider discourse community and not just the teacher as proof of work, because they're use, writing them and creating them to share, then they make sure that their language is better, they make sure that the presentation quality is better, the organization of their key ideas are better and they don't want to put anything out there which shows is a quick skimpy piece of work and therefore I think it really pushes students to work harder. If we're looking at screencasts, yes, I think they're very effective because if you imagine I give bite-sized grammar lessons or bite-sized vocabulary introduction lessons and they're multimedia, they're in Edmodo or eBackpack, something that students have access to both inside and outside the classroom and I encourage students to look at especially the grammar explanations a day or two before the class that we're going to use it in and the rationale behind this is that people need to sleep to change to transfer material from short-term to long-term memory so if you give them 20 vocabulary items or a large grammar explanation and expect them to use it to understand a text there and then they don't necessarily remember them but if there's extended rehearsal if you give it to the students several days beforehand in a seven minute chunk a three minute chunk and they watch it for the first time and try to understand it then you encourage them to watch it again the following day they've had time to transfer this information from short-term to long-term memory and as long as you do something in class which uses that information such as a competitive game when students first come into class and their ability to answer the questions and win the game and these students are very competitive especially male students uh, then they make sure that they've done the work beforehand so that they can score high points in the different interactive games we have and I think that is a very good way of using screencast. The students really like to explain everything so much that sometimes when I'm monitoring the class, if I realize there's a learning gap and I start to explain it, students said, hey, please don't just write it on the board. If you do it in one of the screencast tools, we can watch it again and again. And especially they like to have these in a special place in um, eBackpack. And so before exams, I tell them which screencasts will help them in the exams, especially the grammar exams or the vocabulary exams, and so they go back and reuse those. So it's a tool that's at the student's fingertips. They can use it as a consumer, and I also try to encourage them to use them as creators to share their knowledge for other people in class. So it's a really beneficial tool. Well, actually, we had Explain Everything from the beginning, but Explain Everything is a paid app, and so I was interested in finding out what other apps were out there that were free, so anyone could use them. And also, I wanted to see if there was an interactive app. I tried Screen Chomp and Show Me, but both of those had glitches on the iPad and it was very difficult to get the, the iPad to scroll with them so you couldn't get an extended set of screens with different information on it emerging. But Explain Everything is marvellous and you can embed pictures or videos and you can have it as long or as short as you wish. Of course, the longer it is, the more difficult it is to send and there's a problem with Explain Everything if you send it to an HCT mail address and so one thing I did was get students to all generate their own Gmail addresses I also did this because I use Google Docs 
and it was easier to work with the Gmail address. And also I put the Explain Everything into eBackpack, which they're all members of, or into Dropbox if I shared it with people outside my class who weren't eBackpack members. I also then discovered Ask3. And Ask3 is wonderful because that's the interactive screencasting tool which allows students to write, um, write questions, to send questions, to answer questions and they can answer questions in written form or verbally. And other people in the same class, it's a bit like Edmodo, you get a class code and you invite students into a class as a member of your class code and those students then have access to everyone else's questions and answers. Which is, you, some people might say, hey, well that's the way students can cheat. They won't do the work, they'll just see a student's, a fellow student's answer if you look at it positively, if a student's struggling with an answer, they can see what their fellow students have written and that scaffolds their own answer. So I think it's a, a very, very productive tool which gives students feedback and teachers feedback on what the difficult areas of the lesson are and or that particular grammar structure is and what's working well. Yes, very engaging. Um, students particularly like to see grammar points which are exemplified with examples from the classroom. And so one thing I've been trying to do with the iPad is catch interesting classroom experiences or activities. For example, we all played football and I had lots of photographs. We went to a concert uh, here in the college and I had photographs of the guys on stage with the musicians, etc. So they are also being encouraged to take photographs of different things in the classroom. We do a lot of total physical response where people have a paper with words on it and they move around. So if you can use these resources to then create explanations with pictures backing them up, then the students find them more interesting to watch. And I encourage students to make their own, for example, vocabulary explanations using local pictures and pictures of the college which intrigues them, that's what engages them. So for me, as well as the multimedia aspect of the tool itself, it's that the tool can personalize the learning and make it really fun for the students and make the students feel as though they belong to the learning community. Yes, the students were motivated. I think they were motivated because they had local examples. They were also motivated because a lot of the tools that we used, not just the screencasts, but for example, I've been using QR codes for answer keys. And so within a worksheet, they've got the, the questions there and the answer is there embedded within the QR code so they have to use their telephone or someone else's iPad to access the answers in the QR code. So their eyes can't just automatically go to the answers because all you've got there in front of you is like a, a barcode. However, students I think get really motivated because what they've said is QR codes are used a lot by the Abu Dhabi authorities and so learning to make them and learning to access them has helped them in their outside work as well as their learning and once when I had 21 students in class I asked what's your main rationale for being here is it to learn English to learn about technology or only to learn one or the other and 19 out of the 21 said it was the combination that they really liked so I think students feel that not only are they learning English, but they're learning 21st century skills which make them employable outside of the college and make their lives more efficient outside of the college. And that's very motivating for them. Well, I don't do purely online learning. I do face-to-face, -face, but of course I try to make the materials available for the students so that they can use they can learn outside of the college outside of the classroom so it's important to find bite-sized things because my students are working students they have jobs during the day and they come here in the evening and therefore they need to slot in chunks of learning into a busy life so it's good if you can give them something that they can do while driving the car 
or such as a podcast to listen to or if they can do something like play a game uh, that is downtime in their work so when they're having a break they might play an English game with vocabulary as opposed to play some other game they can quickly review a story one of my greatest successes I think is that as the class has been engaged in the M learning challenge to see which students can read the most they have been reading online books all of the time from the Oxford reading tree or the Oxford um, bookworm series I think and so they've been reading a lot of online books which they do throughout the day and people say they read at work if they have five minutes downtime so the more you can put out there the more you can give them with uh, at their level with an answer key and make it engaging the more they will learn and because the theory of especially language learning is a lot and often it's not four hours with one chunk of language and then don't think about it for the next three days it has to be in order to keep memory going especially as you get older it has to be so to be exposed to similar things between seven and thirteen times through extended rehearsal over a period of several weeks and if we can get our multimedia or apps or tools to, to provide those opportunities for the students, their learning will be deeper. Well, I think the important thing is that you have to learn, you have to decide what's your learning outcome. So you may use the app for classroom management. You may use an app for building rapport you may use the, the apps and web tools, etc., to give a part, you know, to give over a language point. So you've got to work out which are the apps that the students are going to use mostly outside of the classroom or inside the classroom. But especially if you want independent learning, you have to train them to use those apps outside the classroom. And so the main thing is you choose the app that you're going to work on and introduce it in the class get them to use it in the class several times so they become competent with it and then you show them which learning management tool or which sharing system you will share that app or web tool information through so is it that a certain app has to use Dropbox or a certain app can go on to Edmodo. For example, one of the downsides of Edmodo is that you can share, but students can't open up and then work in an app. So if you share a Pages document, they can't just open it up in Pages and work with it. So there are different, different apps which go with different sharing tools. And so what you need to do is make sure students are trained and aware of this and trained with any passwords that they need because they need to learn to store passwords and have access to passwords. Many students, they keep their passwords in note because then they can copy paste and it's a, an efficient way of getting into a platform. You also need to work out, is this a tool that is best used in collaboration with other people or is it a tool that they're going to use on their own? So, for example, if it's a creative book builder, creating an iBook, maybe it's best to get students to work together. And if they are going to work together, how many iPads are you going to use? Who's going to be the instruction giver? Who's going to be taking the photographs and sending them on, etc.? Time efficiency. So you have issues of group management, pair management to think about so that time is spent well spent in class or well spent cl collecting the resources you don't want six people dashing off to take photographs to create a book or to create a movie when two people can be given that task two people can be given the text the script writing task etc so first of all what's the purpose you're going to use the app for what are the classroom management requirements to effectively use this map this app in a certain amount of time and how are you going to share the finished product is it going to be a finished product that is just for teacher consumption or is it going to be for the learning community 
Is it going to be digital donation to a broader world community? If it's going to be given out to the broader world community, do you have to have an editorial stage so that what the students give out is linguistically perfect? It might not be necessary to do that, but you might want it to be perfect if it's going out to the general public. Whereas if you're working just in class, it may be useful to have students putting up their real interlanguage so that from the finished products you can say look guys we've done a fantastic job here but if you look at X and Y and Z you will see we're all making the same mistake now why is this and how can we correct it so it's always a case of effectively working out what you want to do at the end with the finished project you're going to get how you're going to get there and what sub-skills the students need to be able to utilize it ergonomically in limited classroom time.